Good afternoon in uh, Thailand and uh, good morning here in Europe. And uh, I am pleased to be again able uh, to all the 31st What's Happening in Myanmar update. And as you know, this is a monthly event which try to summarize what has been happening in the last month. And uh, we already for a few weeks, we have had for a few uh, times, we have had Debbie as our resource person and Debbie is quite well known. She's the director of ASEAN and a human rights activist devoted her life uh, to Myanmar and uh, change in Southeast Asia. So without further ado, please, uh, Debbie, tell us what has been happening the last months. And I thank again Ajar for collaborating with C Junction uh, in these regular updates. Well, a shout out to Aja. Um, I met uh, some members of the team uh, a couple of weeks ago unexpectedly in Guangzhou, Korea, for May 18th commemoration. Um, I yes, I'm supposed to be talking about Burma, Myanmar, but I one of the special things that happened is uh, for folks who have just been focused on Myanmar, you should be aware that 43 years ago on May 18th, there was a, a very terrible massacre in Guangzhou, uh, a city on the south of South Korea, south of Seoul. And every May 18th, the community has a um, commemoration. And this, uh, with, with such determined um, determination spanning over 40 years, this massacre has been recognized by the Korean government. And on that day, May 18th, the president of South Korea actually goes to the National May 18th Cemetery in Gwangju to lay a wreath and show respect for those who have died for human rights and democracy. I think it's very important for all of us, whether we are working on Myanmar or Cambodia or Vietnam or any other country in this region, uh, where everything seems to be so hopeless, where uh, the oppressor gets more brutal and more restrictive, that it is possible, that it's important to un understand that in the end, dictators don't win. It's the will of the people and it's a matter of time. And so we mustn't give up. And I think that's the takeaway that I, I come, uh, that, that I took with me from Guangzhou on May 18th, um, that, you know, after witnessing and reading about what happened, about the government's consistent attempts to cover up the massacre, the denial, the refusal to acknowledge, and even the persecution of those who sought to surface the truth, um, not Guangzhou now, the residents of Guangzhou now command the respect of their president. And so, um, you know, I, I, want, I wanted to start with this understanding that what's happening in Myanmar now is absolutely horrible. It's unacceptable. And it is unacceptable that ASEAN, as the regional leadership, has yet failed, continue to fail to address this issue with concrete action, this crisis uh, with concrete action, despite understanding that the ongoing uh, uh, actions of the illegal junta, the war crimes, the genocide and the crimes against humanity being committed by the junta poses an imminent threat to human security in this entire region. Um, but you know, we still have to keep on the struggle. We still have to keep on the work. And um, I just wanted to share with you some highlights uh, or some information on uh, uh, what's going on, what's happening in Myanmar as we speak. Okay, can you see? Okay, um, all right, let me just, um, as of 31st of May, there were at least 26,722 armed clashes and attacks, displacing uh, one, more than one and a half million people since February 2021. And this is a conservative estimate. Um, uh, Bangladesh and uh, the western part of Burma, including Rakhine State, Chin State, and parts of Sagain, were hit by uh, Cyclone Mocha a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, it is estimated that between 145 to even more people, uh, including men, women, and children, have been killed. Um, but what happened during Cyclone Mocha was that the junta not only delayed humanitarian access uh, to, to, to communities hit by Cyclone Mocha, they actually conducted violent raids during this period on communities who were going to be hit by Cyclone Mocha. And so, and, and this is actually one of the horrific but not surprising behavior of the junta. And then um, after so much attention and pressure, the junta then uh, claimed to have some type of evacuation uh, attempt for the Rohingya who were stuck in under very horrible conditions already in IDP camps in Rakhine State. And the way they did it actually caused more problems because they took a long time to get around to it. And the, the way they did it really put people in more danger. And of course, um, there was the issues around humanitarian access, about people saying, well, people, about groups wanting to raise funds for the humanitarian response, but also dealing with the very, re the, the very real problem of the junta interfering in the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And this is not only um, over Cyclone uh, Mocha or any natural disaster. This has also been a perpetual, a consistent pattern of interference and obstruction to people displaced and facing threat because of conflict. Now, if that wasn't enough, Crisis 24 and a number of other um, uh, natural disaster experts are warning that tri Tropical Cyclone 3 is actually um, going to be hitting the Bay of Bengal today, right now, actually, June 10th. And um, what, they, uh, what they're saying is that although Tropical Cyclone 3 is not going to be as 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 terrible in terms of intensity and power as cyclone mocha, what um, what it could do is actually um, cause just as much, if not more, damage because it's going to hit communities already damaged or threatened or affected uh, or displaced by cyclone mocha. So it's a second hit on a community already badly hit by cyclone mocha. And surprise, surprise, or maybe not a surprise, Myanmar's Department of Meteorology, Meteorology and Hydrology has not yet issued any warning specific to the storm. So the Bangladesh Meteorological Department has already done the usual. They have a very sound and very proactive established way of dealing with cyclones, including warning the local community and taking the necessary precautions. But Myanmar, the illegal junta, is not issued any warnings so far. So this is yet, you know, all of this is just giving us um, flashbacks to Nargis, where tens of thousands of people were killed because of deliberate bad intention and neglect, the with deliberate withholding of information by the then military junta. And now we're seeing this type of uh, behavior perpetuated even today. So um, we're very, very concerned and we're very, very worried and we're, we're going to be tracking what's going to happen with Cyclone 3 and what happens on the ground as a result. Now, besides serious food cuts to the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, Bangladesh is moving ahead with the repatriation project, the forced repatriation project, trying to push back thousand, uh, well, thousands and eventually the idea is to push back all the all of the million Rohingya currently seeking shelter in Bangladesh, um, and and it is quite shocking that this is still happening. 
and that UN officials like Tom Andrews have already clearly stated that this is actually going to cause much more direct and indirect harm to Rohingya people affected by genocidal violence. Uh, the ASEAN summit, the ASEAN had a summit, um, the chair, Indonesia, whom everyone had hopes for, admitted that not much had been done on, on China, uh, on, on Burma, but also, um, lo and behold, uh, Russia, China, and Singapore were named as top dealers in a one in one billion dollar arms trade with the illegal junta. So Singapore, shame on you! Uh, Singapore, shame on you! You're a member of ASEAN. You've been talking the talk and talking about the importance of engaging and to resolve the issue, but you're adding oil to the fire. Oh, you know, Russia and China are not surprising. Um, and you know, China, huh, China is really uh, something else. Like China keeps talking about wanting to have stability on its doorstep, but then it's fueling instability. So I don't know, Singapore, shame on you, triple shame on you, China, double shame on you, and Russia, what do you expect? Um, uh, we also started to see um, uh, uh, doing all kinds of the Hodonta committing all kinds of, um, I don't know, threats. They're still targeting healthcare facilities and healthcare workers. They're trying to restrict how they work by revoking, by revoking licenses, but also um, talking about uh, making it easier for so-called civilians, mainly militias, aligned to the illegal junta to get weapons. And um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the Thai PM elect, and that's going to be in the next slide. Okay. The pilot repatriation is 1,140 people. Yes, Paul, thank you. Uh, but the, 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 the problem with this pilot um, repatriation is trying to show proof of concept that People will even that it is okay to send forcibly sent back um, the rest of the refugees. Now, here's a WTF moment in Asia. The Cambodian news uh, reported last week that the Cambodian Interior Ministry shut, shut down a conference title review of current humanitarian efforts and seeking effective ways forward, which was supposed to be held in Siem Reap in May, th May 30 to 31st. Now, obviously this is a, a horrific um, conference. Like, I mean, you obviously know review of current humanitarian um, efforts is definitely a, 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 a threat to regional security because the who this um, I was going to say the junta because it's a bit hard to tell difference sometimes between Cambodia's um, government and the Burmese junta because the Cambodian interior ministry said it was an unjustifiable intervention in ASEAN member states and would go against the ASEAN charter to review current humanitarian efforts and seek effective ways forward uh, on Myanmar. So discussing one point in ASEAN's five point consensus is interfering in internal affairs. I don't know which dictionary the Cambodian regime is using, but it just sounds quite horrific and quite ridiculous and oppressive that such such a, a conference that is devoid of politics is actually looking at a humanitarian issue that would be not considered controversial in any way, shape or form, which is also resonant with the five-point consensus 
seems to be such a threat to the ASEAN Charter and would be seen as an unjustifiable intervention. Um, it would seem that Cambodia's interior ministry actually is working against the five point consensus. And so that's our WTF moment for this fortnight in ASEAN. Just imagine our top regional humanitarian experts as well as humanitarian practitioners on the ground being forced to pack their bags and get on the first flight out of town because they were told that they were in they were engaging in an unjustifiable intervention that would go against the ASEAN chapter. Mm. Uh, all this time we were thinking the junta is the one that we should watch. But obviously we're seeing this split in ASEAN and it would appear that Cambodia is against the five-point consensus and maybe is not such an honest broker when it comes to ASEAN human security. So when we last met, it was practically the eve. It was a few days ahead of the May 14th general elections of Thailand. I'm somewhat relieved that the, very relieved actually, that the Thai general elections was not an election of generals or not all of them anyway. Um, you know, uh, for many people engaged on Burma in human rights and democracy, the, the situation in Thailand has been a great source of inspiration, concern, stress, elation. It's been a roller coaster. And that's because Thailand has always been one of the key frontline states of, of Burma. Traditionally, what Thailand did could actually make a huge difference to the movement. Um, traditionally, Thailand did actually rely on the ethnic groups and also exiled dissidents to serve as a buffer and an alternative source of information and analysis on what was going on in Burma. And, um, in 2021, when the coup happened, we saw one of the worst reactions that we ever encountered in decades of the Thai-Burmese relations. That Thailand, or rather the junta, the regime, the authorities, the administration led by General Prayut actually firmly took a stand on the side of the illegal junta that was committing war crimes and atrocity crimes. So May 14th was a very important time for many of us. Everyone was looking very closely at what's going on. And we saw uh, that the Move Forward Party win um, quite the majority of, of, of seats. Um, we are hoping that the empire, the uh, empire does not strike back. That we are hoping, out of solidarity and concern, also for our friends and the people of Thailand, that this country does move forward towards a purely civilian democratic government. Now, Peter Lim Jaranjat, Thailand's prime minister elect, said on seventeenth May that he recognized Thailand's crucial role in ensuring Burma adhered to ASEAN's five-point consensus, adding that one of his priorities would be establishing a Thai-Burma humanitarian corridor. Now, it is absolutely important to understand that opening up or even formalizing cross-border humanitarian work is not just an altruistic gesture. It is very much in Thailand's national interest that communities and organizations 
be allowed to provide humanitarian aid to displaced communities and communities that continue to be targeted with airstrikes, artillery attack, and other, um, other military aggression. Because if we don't do that, um, Burma will be will continue to be a pressure cooker that will eventually um, affect Thailand in much more dramatic ways. So this is absolutely important. And this is also why um, this was actually part of uh, the behavior or the process that Thailand had many years ago, back after the crackdown of 888 that after the 1988 crackdown and subsequent military, military attacks of the previous winter, Thailand actually had a much more flexible, pragmatic, uh, and practical approach to the humanitarian needs on the border. Now, on 21st of May, he wrote in social media that his policies of Burma would engage with all stakeholders focusing on human security considerations including humanitarian and economic aspects. So we can already see humanitarian and economic are tied together. If we are looking at economic sustainability in terms of uh, the relations between Burma and Thailand, um, rather, than, um, rather than looking at a very one-sided, one-eyed view of what economic interests, Thailand economics interests are, then it's going to be quite important to understand that. And on 23rd May, Fwadi Pitsuwan, the foreign affairs chief for Thailand's Move Forward Party, said that instead of quiet diplomacy in dealing with the Burma crisis, Thailand could speak out on the basis of democratic values. Um, rather interesting to see that Fwari Pitsuwan, the foreign affairs chief, or if you, if for those of us who have been wondering, this name sounds familiar. Yes, this is indeed the son of the late Surin Pitsuwan, um, former foreign minister of Thailand, um, who would have, he was even considered uh, a candidate for UN Secretary General, but who also served. Uh, as the ASEAN Secretary General, and who led many key changes in ASEAN, which has since been turned back, turned back and reversed by some very uh, terrible leaders who lack vision. So um, I'm going to stop here on this, try to be as positive here. I'm going to stop here on this note and um, and uh, open the and and respond to any questions. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much, yes, for uh, the comprehensive overview. And this week, I think uh, the issue of the typhoon and the Rohingya situation is one of the main concerns. Uh, so there is a question about an editorial which has come out in the Bangkok Post, uh, which I am not sure you, you are aware, probably you are, which presents a quite uh, pinkish uh, view of uh, how good the Myanmar government has been uh, in taking care of Rakhine State and the impact of the uh, typhoon. Maybe you can comment on that. Another question, uh, what do you think uh, of the Junta Directive that all aid must go to Yangon and through them? And the, what is the UN reaction to this? Okay. So these two first. Um, yes, we were somewhat surprised by that very pinkish, as you say, uh, the rosy view of humanitarian aid. Um, if, yeah, it's quite surprising. And I think it upset many people who saw Bangkok Post as having a, a much more, uh, who had, a, who, who expected more of the Bangkok Post. 
So we are going to see some re reactions to that and I'm not going to preempt that here, except to say, um, I wonder what that person was smoking. Uh, the, by all evidence, the military junta has in no way, shape or form actually helped with the human, they've actually been a hindrance and nobody goes around attacking, launching military attacks on people who are already in vulnerable to a site, who are already vulnerable to a cyclone. I, I really don't um, understand where that's coming from. Um, and the trying to channel all aid through Yangon, yeah, Yangon is the most seriously hit, right? We already know um, human, uh, UN agencies um, and INGOs have had to uh, make a huge number of compromises, sometimes I would say unacceptable compromises in order to maintain a presence in the country. And in doing so, have actually um, uh, in some situations been part of the problem in perpetuating. Uh, by by working with the junta, which has actually been, and we, we already know this from Cyclone Nagis and other humanitarian efforts, the experience, the junta will skim off. They will take economic and political advantage of, of any kind of humanitarian aid that comes within their jurisdiction under their control. And this, the military is, Ex is is very experienced at weaponizing aid against local people. So I think if people still want to labor under that delusion that somehow channeling aid through Yangon and Napidor is somehow going to help people on the ground because this junta has already been bombarding them with airstrikes and artillery fire, and somehow the military is not is is going to change its mind overnight, and um, and be a, and and be transparent and flexible in in ensuring their victims have access to aid. If anyone wants to 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 be deluded in that way, fine. But the reality is that uh, there also has to be a way for communities to help themselves. And this is the biggest problem. Even in the Nagis response, um, even in many other humanitarian crises, people have been prevented from helping themselves. And it's not a sustainable, when people talk about localization, about building resilience, about sustainability of aid, it basically means local people need to decide how to use that aid, not the junta. Local people must have access to resources and information. So you look at that report that came out today. The junta hasn't even told people there's a cyclone, another cyclone coming in their direction. Then he, they, not only have they prevented aid from reaching these people, they prevented information, life-saving information from reaching these people. And that's exactly what they did in Cyclo Nagis, with Cyclo Nagis in 2008, which, which actually made the disaster much worse. So I think we, we do uh, need to think quite carefully about and also ethically about whether humanitarian aid needs to ensure it is not weaponized against the people who need it. Okay, I think there are uh, some other uh, questions. Uh, one uh, about, I, I will read it. Read the news this morning on Twitter that Starlink uh, started providing internet to EDP camp run by Free Burma Rangers in Kareni State. They use this internet for education, especially. 
could you comment and also please help spread the news to international party as this is very important to provide education to the children in the camps. So it's provision of internet by Starlink. Now, another question from our friend uh, from Twitter, you know who it is. Uh, with Nolene uh, standing down as special envoy, is there any hope of an improved UN approach with regard to Myanmar? Okay. So about Nolene, we talked before, but it has come out. Uh, and the question is whether there is hope for improvement. Another last question for now. Uh, recently, the US incorporated the Burma Act of 2021 into its 2023 National Defense Authorization Act. What impact may this action have on the field? This is again from uh, expert in Bangkok. Okay. Um, yes, um, someone did draw my, one of my colleagues did draw my attention to that tweet from, Free, from David Eubank and Free Burma Rangers, uh, thanking Elon Musk and, for, and Starlink. Uh, for months and months, a lot of groups have been saying that the they need access to internet um, as much as they need health uh, as long as much as they need food and shelter. Um, there have been a number of health organizations providing training to nurses and medics online, and the biggest problem that they faced was not about getting trainers, and we got world class trainers doing this. It was about making sure there was a stable internet access. And I think um, many observers and experts have already said um, having, having the people of Ukraine, that the people of Ukraine, despite facing an all out war from Russia, were still able to share information, to get information on how they could take care of themselves and also connect with the outside world because of that internet access because of that uh, satellite internet access. And I think people of Burma need it just as much now. If they are to protect themselves, to be more resilient, but also to keep on learning. And this is something that is absolutely inspiring. Um, I have been involved in a number of online training programs and people, in the country have been absolutely determined to keep on learning, to keep on contributing and keep on learning how to take care of themselves, whether it's basic medical information or health information, or whether it's just connecting with the outside world or um, even talk about, talking about economics. I mean, uh, I remember a friend of mine joined a meeting online. It was at night. I saw her name and I was so excited because I had not heard from her in months. And so she, because she knew I was excited, she turned on her camera and she looked like a ghost because her face was just lit. It was total darkness and her face was just lit by her phone, the light from her phone. And I said, oh my goodness, where are you? And she said, I'm in the jungle near enough to Thailand to use the signal and to get a signal. And I've been charging my phone with solar power the whole day so that I can connect. And that's the kind of dedication and commitment that people have. So I think the international community, but including Starling and Elon Musk, need to extend that to the whole country. I think that's so important. Yes, um, Nolene is standing down uh, less than before. In a, before her, I, I understand she took a two-year term, if I'm not mistaken, and that was uh, starting at the end of 2021. So she should be going until the end of 2023. It's not immediately clear why she's standing down, but uh, in fairness, um, in fairness. Uh, 
this the role of the special the year special envoy um, has always been sabotaged and shackled by its mandate there was not enough clarity of freedom or mandate for the UN Special Envoy to really make a difference. It was really a status quo type of situation. And, um, and the demand of various actors in the movement, including Kin Oma, who was also one of the resource persons in the, the What's Happening in Myanmar updates at Sea Junction, was that the UN Secretary General should take a hands-on approach to resolving this issue, this crisis. So, you know, um, the UN Special Envoy role has traditionally been something of a poison chalice. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a diplomatic suicide mission because the role, the mandate of the role itself is so restrictive and almost ornamental. And, um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Nolin Heza has, uh, has been subjected to all kinds of situations or found herself in all sorts of unfortunate situations, which has made that role even more complicated and compromised. So one of the things that we hope to see is that the UN Secretary General take a more substantive role, a more hands-on role, but also for the, the general, the UN General Assembly and the Secretary General and all bodies of the UN to take a more integrated, integrated um, and uh, approach that's based on integrity. And that if they actually have any kind of special envoy role, it needs to have a mandate that enables the the, uh, the the mandate holder to get real work done. I think that's going to be so important. Uh, um, and not not this this role has been in many respects a token role to show that the UN is concerned. But then uh, different bodies of the UN have been working at cross purposes and and the mandate itself. I mean. She really has been shackled by her mandate. You know, the mandate the mandate should be reorganized and revised to give any potential special envoy wings, not shackles, to have that flexibility and to have the means and the empowerment to actually get concrete action moving forward. Well, the Burma Act. It's a complicated situation. It's a complicated issue. Um, uh, definitely, it's a great start. It provides a legal basis on which the U.S. can move forward. But it's, the U.S. is not going to move forward unless Americans and other people, other stakeholders, keep pushing the U.S. government to act. At this time, the government, the U.S. government is preoccupied with Russia and China, particularly what's going on in Ukraine. Um, but it is important for uh, the US to actually be a little bit more assertive when it comes to dealing with the Burma situation. For um, the past two years, US has hidden or have been, have been rather diplomatic in terms of protecting Thailand's interests, or in this case, General Prayut's interests as head of government, uh, by talking, referring to Thailand as the only treaty um, partner of uh, the US, and keep referring to how many hundred years of uh, decades, hundred over hundred years of diplomatic relations, blah, 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 blah. But now is the time that um, there is a regime change in Thailand, and it is an opportunity. Well, it's it is basically a shout out or a signal, or hopefully a wake up call to Washington D.C. that they cannot hide behind their relationship with Thailand to avoid act more concrete actions. It's time for them to understand the regime change in Thailand should also um, be a change in the US's role 
uh, in their approach on Burma. They have to take the kid gloves off. They really have to work solidly with Thailand to make sure this coup is reversed. It's in everybody's interest. Thank you. We still have quite some uh, questions. Uh, so I will uh, repeat again and relate it uh, to the question before. Uh, recently, the US incorporated the Burma Act into the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, the, the question, I mean, the one who asked the question is repeating uh, that my question was more about the integration itself. So what is the implication of this integration, the fact that the Burma Act has become part of the US defense authorization? What is the impact of that? What is the implication of that? I think and, if, yeah, I think if you look at our um, legislation and sanctions imposed on Burma or actions imposed on Burma, Usually, it's incorporated under the Defense Authorization Act. It's more of a, it is more of a, um, how do we say, a bureaucratic um, um, uh, uh, a strategy to get make sure it gets put in a place of some degree of priority. Um, it's not doesn't mean that the U.S. is about to send um, any military aid whatsoever. At this point, um, the US approach is to avoid military means and to support diplomatic and other means. So we have to actually understand, don't get too excited and don't get ahead of ourselves. Uh, this doesn't mean that the, that the US is gonna be sending weapons anytime soon. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're going to be pushing or being willing or able to enforce a kind of a no-fly zone or any of that sort of thing that a lot of people on the ground have proposed. At this point, it would be really great if the U.S. were to sanction Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, which forms one of the um, most important sources of revenue for the illegal junta. It would be good if the U.S. can sanction aviation fuel so that the junta has no more means to inflict airstrikes on the people. They, they really are depending more and more on airstrikes simply because moving troops on the ground has been increasingly dangerous. Um, and it also would be great if the U.S. actually leaned more on Singapore to stop selling or allowing weapons or any kind of hardware or software that could be used to kill civilians. Get Singapore to stop sending that to the military junta. Get Singapore to start freezing more assets. I mean, this uh, many generals have used Singapore as their personal hospital for their health checkups and, and health treatments. They've used Singapore banks to keep their money. It's time for Singapore to start moving in that direction. And it would be great if the US actually spoke with Singapore, one of its allies, to make sure this happens. Okay, so uh, continue with the other <laughs> question. Which country are the strongest supporter of the junta? And uh, how are they able to continue to operate a government in light of the opposition from so much of the population and the sanction by several countries? And maybe a last uh, question, uh, which is there are a, a number which relates again to the role of the UN and uh, whether they should have a presence in Myanmar or not. Uh, so you can, I think you have commented already various times on, on this uh, issue, but related to this, what do you think uh, CSOs should do considering the information in the article Myanmar civil society organization face a moral conundrum on funding in the Irrawaddy? Uh, I don't know if you have read this article, but... Uh, if you have, what is your thinking about that? I think that is the final 
three questions for today. Look, the 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 junta is able to continue operating despite sanctions because we haven't had enough sanctions in place. We do need to have effective and strategic sanctions, not just statements. And so there has to be um, a, a very strategic means to halt the flow of revenue. Um, and we saw that the EU has already sanctioned Myanmar oil and gas enterprise with, but while still allowing member states to have some discretion, um, that needs to be that needs to be locked up. That 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 those gaps have to be filled. Um, we have to see the U.S. acting in this direction as well, um, and we should actually um, uh, understand that. An aviation fuel uh, sanction is absolutely essential. The UK and Canada have already imposed one. We haven't heard from Australia. So we do need to actually see that moving ahead. And having said that, the junta is having a tough job of survival. Uh, and this is why they've been increasingly brutal because they're trying to intimidate the population into submission. Uh, I don't think this military has faced this much resistance and these many losses because they are not just um, losing soldiers to fighting by ambushes by PDFs and ethnic uh, resistance organizations. They are also losing a huge number of people to defections because they are not even getting support from their own institutions, from people within their own institutions. So the question is about how long can the resistance last? How is basically a question of ensuring that the resistance outlasts the junta. And one way of doing that is cutting off revenue, access to revenue and weapons and other means that can, and other, um, uh, and other, factors that can or means that can be weaponized by the junta against the civilians. So I think that's really, really important to understand. Um, uh, I think, you know, I have, I'm a Malaysian. I've been supporting human rights democracy movement in Burma since 1988, and I have not seen the resistance this strong on all levels. We're not just talking about armed resistance. We're talking about political, social, cultural, and economic resistance as well. So I think this is absolutely, absolutely important. We haven't had enough sanctions yet, and we haven't had enough sanctions by enough governments. And this is where ASEAN needs to be able to stand back and say, okay, maybe like Singapore, Singapore, maybe Singapore, despite rushing ahead to sanction Russian companies while saying we don't want to sanction Myanmar and while at the same time also selling and providing weapons and other um, uh, technology to this illegal junta, maybe they should stop doing that. They and know which what they have to do. The strongest supporter of the um, Obviously, what we've seen, this 1.5 track in India that Thailand also hosted uh, uh, earlier this year, a, a meeting with the junta, the illegal junta, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, and the way Cambodia is behaving most recently to shut down a very benign humanitarian uh, aid uh, conference by calling it uh, an unacceptable intervention in the internal affairs. Um, we already start to see that this is uh, uh, these are some of the biggest supporters politically. But in terms of weapons, we can clearly see Singapore, Russia, and China. And Russia, if Sing Russia might be on the other side of the world. It might be the evil empire but for now. But China and Singapore is in the neighborhood. And they should be more responsible in terms of, of, of avoiding and avoiding to give an illegal junta the means to commit more atrocity crimes. So I think that's going to be important. 
when we talk about sanctions, there's actually there were actually so many dismantling of sanctions after 2010. And now what we're trying to do is get make sure that there are targeted sanctions that make a that make a substantial impact. Some of the sanctions enacted have made an impact, and that's good, but we need to do more. Because the sanctions, if the sanctions are working, we should already be saying, well, the sanctions are working. It's time once and for all to make sure the entire international community stands solidly with each other, that we have san targeted sanctions across the board without any gaps, without any sanctions busting uh, methods, so that the junta can get gets the message so that the the resistance can outlast the junta. So that's where we are at. With INGOs, with CSOs and UN, do we stay or go? The reality is that CSOs and CBOs need to continue their work. They need to continue their work. And they are in the communities that are affected. And we need to support them in so many ways. And a lot of groups and donors have actually been creative and flexible in ensuring that CSOs and CBOs can get, get the aid and the funding that they need. The question is the rest of the aid community, whether they are willing to be flexible and agile enough to make sure that resources go to people who need it, that resources actually make a difference in terms of building local resilience and ensuring sustainability beyond the coup. I'm not going to talk about whether the UN should stay there or not, but I should say that there has to be some integrity and ethics in the way things are done. And, you know, when it comes to humanitarian aid, people keep invoking do no harm. But when we saw do no harm being used as an excuse to either do nothing or to do something in a totally different direction that may actually contribute to long-term harm. So I'm not going to give a blanket statement on all agencies. I'm just saying they know what they're doing and they know what they're doing right and they know what they're doing wrong. And they shouldn't be hiding behind bureaucracy. Okay, so I think this time Debbie has been very diplomatic. In their <laughs> I talked about ASEAN's what the <laughs> fuck moment, WTF. Oh, no, no, WTF. I'm talking about the way of not commenting on the UN, but yes, the blank statement are never uh, very good indeed. Uh, and it's good to pay attention to the detail. I think also for the situation of the elections in uh, Thailand, uh, we know that they are struggling at the moment uh, to get the right and their entit entitlement to form a government. Uh, so uh, that will influence also whether they're able or not to influence uh, the policy, foreign uh, policy. And immigration policy is always very much controlled by all kinds of security agencies. So again, uh, what the government possibility are there, we remain to be seen. So a lot to be seen in the next months. And then we will meet again one month from now, about the same time again on uh, the day will be around the 10th of the next month to see more what is happening with the Thai election and what is happened more uh, with the implication of the Thai election and whether the next typhoon, if indeed, uh, arrives to Myanmar will be handled better than the previous uh, one. These are among the points that were raised today and remain relevant for uh, the next update. So remain, continue to follow us and uh, please share the video also after uh, today so that more are able to be updated. It's very important to continue to pay attention uh, what about what is happening in Myanmar. We cannot just let it disappear from the public agenda. So with that, 
Thank you, Debbie, again. Uh, thank, you, thank you to Ajar and thank you for those uh, who continue to follow us. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. And don't forget more details in the Alt Science monthly cohort. So don't forget to subscribe. Bye bye, everybody. Thanks, Leah. Bye. 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 bye.